Daniel, thank you so, so much for um, zooming on in. I super appreciate it. I was just explaining to everyone, I have followed this column. I've read the book back to front, back to front. I've passed it on to many people and I love the show. So firstly, thank you for creating it all. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. So I was wondering, how did, how did this actual career path start for you? So how did you know, journalism and the New York Times all come to fruition? Um, that's a very long, complicated story, and I'll try. Okay. To oh, it, sorry. <laughs> I'll try to keep it really short. Um, but um, I never pictured myself in this kind of job, um, working for the New York Times. I was kind of a drifter um, after college. I went out west and was like a ski instructor in Park City, Utah, for a few years, and then went to graduate school in Tucson, Arizona. Anyway, that to speed up the story. Um, I met uh, the woman who had become my wife in grad school. We moved to New York, spent the 90s in New York. Oh, well, that was, was that fun? It was, um, it was hard. Like I, I, didn't, I was like 29 years old and didn't have any job experience at all. And um, anyway, I, I worked for in sort of low level editorial positions. All through the 90s, we had two kids. We couldn't afford the city any longer. Um, and moved to Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, and, it, and we thought that that would sort of be our dream life, like living actually in the house that I'm in now, um, living in this Victorian house in this quaint college town um, and both writing and, and editing. And it turned out to be like really hard instead. <laughs> we got on each other's nerves constantly and we had the kind of marriage that everyone my age had who were doing professional jobs where um you know even though the men in the marriage are doing the husbands are doing much more with child care and all the domestic chores than they ever had in the past um still the women were the ones who were trying to juggle being mothers and taking care of domestic stuff and having work um so anyway my wife whose name is kathy hanauer did a decided to edit a book called The Bitch in the House. Um, 20, 26 Women Tell the Truth About Sex, Solitude, Work, Motherhood, and Marriage. And uh, it was essays about, um, mostly about that, about that kind of relationship, but also about other, um, other relationship issues. And it was just a huge hit. It was a New York Times bestseller and, um, and led to pressure on me to do, to do a male companion volume um, that was called The Bastard on the Couch. 27 men tr try really hard to explain their feelings about love, loss, fatherhood, and freedom. And the two of those books together just, um, they got a ton of attention. They were done because they were done by husband and wife and uh, they had um, crude titles. Um, and they were good, like they had really good, um, deep material. And so the, the then style editor of the New York Times, um, his name is Trip Gabriel. Uh, he still works at the Times, he's a, he's a national reporter. Um, but he wanted, to he wanted to create a column about relationships where people were writing essays about relationships. Um, and he, they did a story on us for the style section and then had us in and he proposed this idea. Um, and so we started as a couple and we had to come up with like a prototype that was, um, I think it was four or five essays that we commissioned. Um, and in that process, my wife dropped out because she, she was working on a novel. She, it wasn't really a two person job. She didn't want to do it. And, I was unemployed and didn't, <laughs> didn't really have <laughs> anything else to do. Um, so I sort of took it over. And even at the time, I thought it would last a year. The editor who was assigning it, um, who hired me, um, predicted it would last a year or two. And so I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. It's nearly 16 years later. And um, that, still, um, I've, to, to have it is 16 years is not. Yeah, it's crazy. And it just goes to show the strength, I swear, of like human empathy and intrigue. 
you know, we all just kind of want to, we all find validation and like reassurance in other people's happiness and troubles. <laughs> yeah. And nothing ever interrupts it. Like, it's funny, like the, um, like something like this pandemic comes up and whole sections of the times have to adjust dramatically, you know, like the sports section is no longer appearing on Sunday. There's no sports happening. It's such good point. Fashion is like yeah, the, the travel section um, is going on hiatus for a while. There's no nobody's traveling. Um, the arts and leisure section has zero advertising for because there's no <laughs> movies and no there's no Broadway and there's no theater. Um, there's no live music. So. Uh, and styles is is about how we live, so it, it it can adjust. But there's no weddings happening. Like we have a whole wedding section. There's no weddings happening. Um, but modern love is just it's how we love today. You know how we love it. It 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 um, it, it changes, but there's also a consistency to it that people always want to know about. So in this is just a quick one, but how many? I'm just interested. How many stories do you think you've actually read? over all this time because it's just you and one other person right or yeah it was just me for um probably the first 11 years and uh now it's one other person helps um but uh i don't know i mean i it's only a guess but i'm guessing like 150,000 stories we get um eight or ten thousand a year and i don't you know, I obviously don't read every one of them. I open, we open them up and we start to read them. And we, if, if it's interesting, um, it has to keep us interested to read. But um, I, yeah, I don't know how many I've read all the way through, but I've opened and started to read probably 150,000. So on Monday mornings, when you get to your desk, your email, <laughs> they just <laughs> through the roof. <laughs> one, one um, sort of consequence of all these new projects, like the, about five years ago or so, the column really started to expand um, first into podcast. <clears throat> and then um, the TV show was in development for a while before it actually came out. Um, but I love these new projects. Like they're what give me energy and enthusiasm to, to keep at it. Um, and we started, we started doing live events and a bunch of other things. So just like the column expanded in all these ways. Um, but um, all that, there was sort of limited time. And those, those were like more exciting than, you know, <laughs> sitting, at, sitting at your desk, staring at the computer. I was going to so, say, when, you're, when, you're, when it was filming, did you just pop on? I saw, I swear you're in an episode. I've definitely seen you. Yeah, I have, I have two cameos. And um, I was at the beginning of episode six. And I was in the background of episode four. Um, but if you're a good extra, you're not supposed to be noticed. So most people have not noticed me because I was a very good. Oh, you're extra. terrible in my eyes. <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure that that's like, I have also probably watched it more than the average person. <laughs> so it's a little like, it's got to just be magical being on set and seeing that those were the words that you worked with someone to bring to life. You know, or... yeah, the whole process of the TV show has been magical. It, it, it has been, um, I mean, the people who, who are doing the show are really decent and smart and caring. And um, whatever sort of preconceptions I had about, about Hollywood or about actors, um, it, it just, it, 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 it doesn't have that sort of elevated feel to it. It's very human. It's a very human endeavor. And um, everybody is kind and hardworking, really hardworking. <laughs> and uh, I loved it. I loved every bit of it. I went to the set. Um, it filmed all in, all in New York. And I was working in New York, you know, all that time. So um, every morning at like five in the morning, we'd get the email that said that had the, the day's um, shooting schedule attached and all the locations. Um, so I would just make time in my day and I'd I'd go wherever they were um, and it was yeah it was completely fun the whole thing was uh, both both being on set um, and then post-production uh, you know seeing how it was 
edited into into episodes and music added and um, the soundtrack the soundtrack is beautiful oh thank you i've, they, I've been the that. the uh, i i do you know what i can't remember which episode it in but i i swear to god i listened to it um remember the war that song oh yeah da, 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 da. like oh my god that's just a um yeah that's a tearjerker um just just completely roughly for one episode how long would that take to film I know it would like kind of, you know, flip between on, depending, but just on a general, it like. Was, it, was, it was totally rigid. It was six days per episode. Oh, really? That's um, it? And it was scheduled to the minute. Like um, every, yeah, it was, it was all, you know, blocked out. Um, there was only one day in the whole calendar, in the whole schedule, um, where one of the actors was sick. Um, and they had to take a they had to take a day, um, an insurance day they called it. Like they buy insurance, you know, for that. Oh yeah, of course. Everybody, of course. you know, the set has 130 people on it or something, and and it costs a ton of money um, if you don't film. And that was I think that was the only day that, that interrupted the schedule. But otherwise, it was like clockwork. It was six days per episode. It didn't matter what the weather was, um, and. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was fast. I have to say a big thank you also, because in this lockdown, it sounds really, I mean, it doesn't sound silly, but personally, I've been watching so much of New York. It feels like I'm not in New York, but the energy of New York is so beautiful. And when I watch Modern Love, especially, um, God, uh, he, uh, hers, hers was a world of one. That's my favorite one. Um, and just watching it and that was my favorite it. episode too. Oh my! And those actors, or yeah. oh, they are just like Olivia, Olivia Cook and um, oh, why am I blanking on the hot priest name? Oh, the hot priest! That's exactly <laughs> what I call him. I no, I'll, I'll I'll find out, but I call him hot priest, so I can never remember his name either. <laughs> the two of them um, from the hospital on it just like that was the episode that. Um, I was it in tears. Withstood, it withstood the most viewings for me because I saw all these episodes many, many times. Um, and that one, um, that one improved the most through editing. And then once it was finished, um, I could watch it over and over and over and it moves me every time at the end. That, uh, really powerful. I've cried in, I mean, full disclosure, I've cried in all of them, but that one I definitely, I think, cried the most. But I just think New York as a city as well, th those episodes and the and the column and everything just feels like a warm hug at the moment. It really feels like a nice hug. Right. Like a, um, but I was also, the very final episode, I'm just interested, when they entwine them all together, mm -hmm. was that something they came up with? Or, because that was, when that started happening, I was like, oh, now we can see all the, <laughs> or how did, that was that That's meant to happen? That's something that John Carney came up John with. Car okay. um, they were searching for a way to, you know, because these are all independent stories yeah. and they were searching for a way to, to unify them that would be a device, but that would, um, that would extend, um, that it would extend the, the series. So it was, it was looking for way, looking for pieces of each story, either that happened before that story took place in the episode or after, or something that was, was within that, chronology, um, but that would add sort of a new layer, like how how the couple met that wound up um, in the hospital where he falls off and cuts his arm on the, you know, you find well, out how they- out the window and she's like, yeah, they're all good. <laughs> so you, yeah, that too, yeah, that, um, so it was, it was a little, it was figuring out a little piece that could, could add and tie together and that, they coordinated that with a rainstorm, you know, where every episode had its, had the rain truck, you know, had the big rain tanker, water tanker and the rain machine. So every week that had to show up and they had to have their rain, their rainstorm. Um, it was funny. I didn't, I didn't know how that was going to work. And it didn't, um, it didn't work for me like it would work for a viewer because I knew it was going to happen. Like I knew the script and, that was a part where I didn't feel like I could, um, I could watch it objectively. It's like, I just, I, I knew that was coming and I think it works probably works better if you didn't know it was coming and you're surprised by all those, um, all those sort of little pieces of scenes. I, okay. I know you're probably not allowed to say, but I do know there's a season two. 
Um, do you, have, do they know what stories they're shooting? Have they started shooting it? Uh, they know what stories they're shooting. We have- Oh, they do? You know, oh, you guys do? Yeah, all of the, um, it was supposed to start last, last, when was it? Um, it was supposed to start a month ago or so. Oh no, <laughs> ready for well, October. Hollywood, Hollywood is shut down. Um, but it'll start back up again soon, as soon as they can. But they have all the um, all the scripts and everything picked out. Uh, Are you gonna yeah. have your cameo? You gotta get a cameo. I've suggested that they have me like deliver a pizza in every episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You do like an Alfred Hitchcock and just kind of turn up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Or like I, a little I've disguise. A couple of times now. I haven't quite gone for it, but I think that would be the best unifying like device. Um, and last for you, because I know that you're super busy, but I was wondering, um, post all the articles that get sent in to you, obviously there becomes quite a lot of human emotion involved. Is there anyone, are there any of them that you've kept in contact with or you've actually met up with or you've kind of re had a relationship with? Um, of the writers? Of the, yeah, the people, sorry, the people that um, send yeah. their stories in. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, a lot of the stories have touched me personally. Some of some of them that I really um, that I really worked hard on. I mean, occasionally these stories take months because there are legal issues or complications with people being written about, and um, they get very involved. And um, so I get to. I mean, usually a typical essay will just take a week to work on, but. Sometimes they take place over a longer period of time. The, the editorial process takes a longer period of time, and I get to know people. And um, yeah, I keep keep in touch, and sometimes hear um, updates in their lives, you know, based on what they send in again. In fact, an essay just from a few weeks ago by a writer named Patty Dan that was her life was affected by the pandemic because her um, she lived in New York and her husband lives in Baltimore and um, they're very happy living separately. They're, it's a late in life marriage. Um, and for the pandemic, they had to live together. Like it was either you live together, or live completely apart. So they chose, chose to live together and he came to New York and picked her up. And it's a very moving essay about that, but that's her third modern love essay. And her first modern love essay was about her, her young husband, um, dying of, of brain cancer. I think he was in her, four, they were both in their 40s at the time. Uh, really powerful essay about that. And when she published it, um, this guy in Baltimore, um, who was a widower in Baltimore, read it and was so moved by it and wrote to her. And it's the, it's the only couple that I'm aware of where um, a marriage was let was created by the connection through the modern love column where where he wrote to her and said how much her essay mo meant to him and they started corresponding and then they met and fell in love and got married and then that story was her second modern love essay and now her third has the is the pandemic so over this is this is over about love film. Years. Hmm? she could have the first modern love film I know. <laughs> so that's over about like 12 years, her three essays have, have tracked her life. But it's so interesting because when I read them, like, I have to admit, after I read the book, I basically went and searched every person that they wrote at the end who it was, <laughs> which is bizarre and sounds really weird. So I apologize. <laughs> but like, yeah. just that pure human interest. And I know, and like recently when I was reading the ones, I can't remember how long ago they went up, where you followed up with a couple of the episodes from, um, you did interviews with a couple of the people from the television show. Oh, yeah, with four of the four of the writers for the show. Yeah. And that was and that was so incredible and so it was so bizarre how much of a connection I felt that I knew about. Sorry, I can't remember her name, but the lady that Anne Hathaway portrayed. Um, and Harry Cheney, yeah. And it, and it, I don't know. It, it, it's so funny that you you every time I start reading one, I'm like bollocks. I want to know what's happening. Like yeah. <laughs> I wanna, or like the lady recently. What, the one who somebody I was reading the other day who who died in the um her neighbor passed away and she'd just gone through a breakup. Oh yeah, yeah. And I'm like Sarah, no, I'm just... Sarah Rosen. It's 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 
it's incredible. Is there okay. any advice for anybody out there um, that you have for someone who's looking to pursue a dream in journalism? I, I think the best model for this is the is the woman who works with me. Um, her name's Mia Lee, and she, her title is Modern Love Projects Assistant. Um, but she's been working with me since she was a freshman in college at Columbia University, and um, I was looking for for interns to um, to help with a college contest that we have every few years, and like I I. I I would encourage like undergraduate undergraduates who are interested in whatever field they're interested in, but if it's journalism to um, to totally overperform like she I wasn't I wasn't even considering freshmen or sophomores to be an intern. Um, and but it was open to them um, and she she submitted anyway. It was like the fall of her freshman year. And and just sort of passed the passed the editorial test did better than than anybody um, I ended up taking on a graduate student in jur in journalism and her as a freshman um, and I, and we've since talked about it because now she works at the times and as a, has a staff job and is working on all these projects and does the tiny love stories um, series that we started a little over a year ago um, but she just threw herself into it and has for me read for the contest, read for um, the regular column when I was able to get a monthly stipend for someone to help with that. And then when she graduated, we were able to hire her. And it's so hard to get jobs in journalism. Um, and she's smart and, and educated, but it was really her work ethic. Um, and I've taken on other interns who, um, for contests like that in the past where they just like write to me directly and they know the column and they say you know i'm i'm a fan i read it all the time and you can't really fake that you know it, it has to be genuine um but i know with other people at the times that's true as well like go for it and pursue it and then deliver um and i asked her it wasn't wasn't too long ago because i just thought it was so unlikely that someone who was a freshman in college would wind up working um working for me for that long while she was a college student and then be hired straight out of college like these jobs are just so hard to get and so competitive um i think the times gets twenty thousand applications for its 16 fellowship spots um <laughs> so it's like it's so hard um but if you get you know a little opening and you write to someone and they write back um pursue that pursue that like it, i think these people are more accessible than than people think um but uh if, if you have a, if you have a passion and especially the, the the area of growth at the times is audio uh the, the audio team is what's really expanding and they're really successful and um the daily is this like flagship that just um uses so much staff and talent but they're they're rolling out just podcast after podcast after podcast Did you listen um, to the i love new york the guy wrote for the daily one i forgive you new york mm -hmm. there was a, there was a I, I listened to it i think i listened to a daily one recently and it was like uh this gentleman he's actually english he's now a new yorker wrote a i forgive you new york oh my god i was wailing oh i didn't see it, oh. I didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's good, it's good stuff, but that's sort of the, the future of journalism is that kind of multimedia, you know, like ha having a place like the New York Times that can do everything, you know, video, audio, um, digital, print, just delivering it in, in all these different ways. Um, but people who are hungry for that and who are talented, there's, there's room for them. You know, it always shocks me. Um, I have some friends that like say some Condé Nast publications or whatever, and it shocks me that I always just assume, I assumed with you there would be, I don't know, 20 of you sat in an office going over this, you know, it, it's yeah. amazing, but it's just such little teams. And like, I, there's a friend who does the video over uh, um, um, uh, Glamour and it's like, there's just like one of them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the, times, the times especially is, is individuals. It's, um, you know, it's, 
an individual and people don't really have assistants like she's called her her job title includes the word assistant but she's not my assistant like she has her own portfolio of work and um we have a new seating arrangement now but i used to sit next to vanessa friedman who's the uh the fashion director for the times and it's her you know she does everything she writes stories and she edits um she goes to fashion shows she knows the industry uh, but all these people are are one people one person and a desk you know <laughs> and they're they're real powerhouses um God, it's it's so it's i'm sort of in awe of a lot of people who work there so it's i was wondering um last one is there have you had anyone reach out to you over like a DM or anything that blew you away to say like, I listened to this or, you know, I, I, I keep up with your column. I don't know, someone in the industry or maybe someone that you've idolized or, you know, you respect, et cetera. Um, God, I can't think offhand. People all the time um, are writing to, uh, who are either sort of grateful or, a fan of one one piece or another. I mean, that what's interesting about the column is how it it became. It was a very very much United States, um, and with the podcast especially, it became very international. About a, about a third of the podcast listenership is international, and then with the with the television show, it's just gone completely international. Um, like Amazon. I mean, I grew up at a time when like a TV show was, was only the United, you know, it was only the United States. Um, and the idea that they, like, I, I want, I, w I was curious why there was so much time between um, the end of filming, because they would, they were putting together the episodes as they were filming them. Um, and then they had to edit them and that all took time, but there was a huge gap of time between then and when the show could come out. And a, a, a lot of that time is that it has to be prepared for all these international markets. It has to be dubbed. It was dubbed into eight or 10 languages, um, subtitles in another eight or 10 languages. Um, and that all has, yeah. that, that all takes so much time to create every international edition that it all drops at the same second around the world. Uh, but that was fascinating, all, all that process and just what they have to, what they have to keep in mind in terms of what is a show that's for the world versus a show that's for one audience with, with one aesthetic and one language. I think it definitely does all that. And um, last one, if, so for example, I read for pleasure, you read for your work. Do, what do you do? What's, what do you do for fun? <laughs> if you're just like constantly reading all the time, do you have any other hobbies? No, pathetically, I really don't at this point. Like, <laughs> My job is my life. I was um, hoping you were going to watch like Bravo or something. Is there no like crappy TV or anything? I, that, like... uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't even watch TV that much anymore. Um, I don't know. I try to go skiing once a year. I try to like have a nice beach vacation a year. I have a, a dog that I walk. I like going back and forth from New York to, to Massachusetts. Um, but otherwise, my life is, is about work my work and my kids but my kids are, aren't so much kids anymore <laughs> thank you so so much thank you and uh, yeah I'm, that thank you that's all thank you thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs>